Kia ora, ni hao, and hello. Welcome to the Cherry Journal podcast. I'm your host Camille Yang. My guest today is Alison Wang. She is the founder of a yoga brand, Awake. She is currently living a digital nomad life and writing a blog and running a podcast channel. Alison and I used to be online friends, but we finally met in Madeira and recorded this podcast sitting in front of the Atlantic Ocean. The sound quality might not be perfect, but you will be able to hear the sound of waves and feel the Zen vibes where we were talking about meditation, self-realization, and love. I hope you enjoy this episode. It's so random we met in Madeira because <laughs> I know you live in Europe, but、uh, I never expect to meet you here. <laughs> yeah, it happened also quickly. I think we got to know each other in、mm-hmm. when I was in Hamburg. So it's、yeah. like two or three months ago, right?、Uh-huh. Yeah, I was in London, and I、yeah. thought, yeah, I might meet you in Germany or <laughs> in the UK, but never expect here. Yeah, exactly. So how how long have you been living in Madeira? I have been here since the summer, the I think midsummer. So it has been one half month, and I'm leaving tomorrow. Oh, very <laughs> soon.、So、what's your feeling about Madeira as a digital nomad village? Yeah, it's very interesting because it's such a new thing in Europe.、Mm-hmm. Usually, the village are always like in Bali or in Chiang Mai、yeah. in Southeast Asia. And so since COVID, and it's like oh, you're so far away from a kind of community base. So I was in Berlin for a year,、mm-hmm. and then after arriving in Madeira, it's like an instant feeling of sense of belonging.、Oh. Like obviously, that's you know part of the pros <laughs>、yeah. of having a community. But they are really doing a good job on the island to build. Um, to you know, try to facilitate everything for、uh-huh. digital nomads and for remote wor- workers.、Yeah. So ever since COVID, the digital nomad kind of grow exponentially, right? Like、I see. The, the concept, yeah. yeah so. Yeah. Very popular here. I found it so interesting, like so many activities. Because before I moved here, I expect probably I will <laughs> live here by myself alone. Village life, yeah, village life, fisherman town, <laughs> or something. Now I find the CrossFit activity group and a lot of parties, like boat parties. Yeah,、uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You've experienced、uh, the fun part already.、Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I find a lot of、uh, crypto people here. Oh yeah, yeah. true. Yeah, so they're, and they're a lot、everywhere. of entre- yeah entrepreneurs. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's a very interesting crowd.、Mm-hmm. Uh, to have a saying that. The digital nomads nowadays are basically, you know, the people when they were twenties, they were the backpackers.、Mm-hmm. So it's the backpacker <laughs> packers who grew up, you know, living、yes. their ideal life. Yeah, <laughs> and we all have a commitment <laughs> issues. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. So how how did you start your nomad life? Because I know you you live so many different places. Can you walk me through your journey? Yeah, I think so. I started in two thousand eighteen, so、mm-hmm. it has been three years. Something like that, but、um, I've known the idea, like kind of to have time and mobility and to have the freedom,、mm. um, since I was still in graduate school, and so I think when I was twenty-three or something. So I heard about it. I was very interested, but I never thought, oh, it could be me, because you know, I was. Raised or I was educated to be an employee,、mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. and I tried that, and I figured, oh, maybe I have to save enough money for it, or we maybe I have to, you know, have my own business for it or whatever. So I kind of put it off for a while, but、uh, it has never become my goal. Like, oh, I have to achieve,、mm. you know, to become a digital nomad. It just happened quite naturally. I think in two thousand eighteen. I I was at that time I was living in Germany and、uh, it was kind of boring and <laughs> <laughs> and I was obviously in a you know certain period of life in a phase that you're trying to figure out you're growing up now and what do you what who are you really、yeah. what do you want not the society tells you what do you want and so then I started to thinking oh I, actually I can just give it a try.、Mm. So it all started without plan. I just went to Southeast Asia with my husband actually at that time too. Because it's the cheapest, <laughs> you know, least <laughs>、yes. pressure for sure,、mm-hmm. for living, and then just started from there. So we've been to Southeast Asia, and、uh, I was roaming around in India, and then East Europe, and then Germany, and 
now in Portugal, yeah.、Mm. So only in Asia and Europe for now. I see. So how do you support yourself while doing the nomad life? Yeah. So it's also like while you know trying to support myself、mm-hmm. and、uh, trying to also build something.、Yeah. So it was very interesting. I started writing as a blogger,、mm. so on Chinese platforms. Yeah. And、uh, I figured. In the beginning, I was trying to, you know, thinking maybe I should. I was reading Tim Ferriss. I was reading, you know, all、oh, these, hours, you know, life hacks、yeah. and the productivity things. So I got quite into it.、Um, it's very helpful for sure in the beginning、mm-hmm. to try to build something. So, but for me, what really brought for me is trying to follow, you know, be really interested in what I am interested in. So、mm-hmm. instead of building a business, I kind of. Are in a, I was in a quest to you know really looking into what made me me and why are we here.、Mm. So it sounds very weird, but that's what I've been writing for past three years,、yeah. and also all the content I was making. So I don't know how to label myself, and I、mm. kind of don't want to label it. So I have a business. I have a yoga brand、yeah. in China. I sell yoga outfits and、yeah. yoga mats,、mm. but interestingly, only. For a certain type of model, so I don't really update it yearly. Actually, the mats I'm selling nowadays is still three years ago what I've、oh, made.、Wow. So I'm trying to, you know, also understand that what made me happier at that time was trying yoga. Was not, you know, like some magic、uh-huh. you know, that I want to, you know, promote for everybody. Oh, now you should all be yogis、uh-huh. and something.、Yeah. But I believe the yoga mat. It's so such an easy product. It helped me. So I truly believe. In you know the people who are using it, the mat will help them.、Mm-hmm. So that's my core business actually.、Ah, And then all my writings are generally just a kind of public self introspection because to look into my weakness,、mm-hmm. you know, to look into as a human what's wrong with us, <laughs> 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 like why are we never satisfied? Yeah. So I was very very interested in these topics. And it's very fun. I'm doing everything I love. I read、mm-hmm. and then. I write. I write not for the sake of earning money,、mm. but it kind of the dots are all connected in the、mm. end. So the sales are obviously the products. So that's、yeah. mainly what supported me the、yeah. whole time. And I also have quite some passive income for yoga classes,、mm-hmm. like online classes,、yeah. and meditation. You know, like boot camps or something like that. Yeah. I、yeah. think that's how I know you online through reading your content. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> so it's the podcast, though. Yeah. Yeah. Also the podcast. Yes,、yeah. so、I have a Chinese podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Only in、yeah. Mandarin. So yeah. <laughs> Follow Camille. Can, <you> <laughs> can you explain the name of your podcast? It's called Shan Feng Dian Huo. So how,、yeah, how、exactly. do you explain it in English? The、uh, fan your flames or something.、Yes. So at that time, I was so into podcasts. I was listening to a, you know a lot of episodes from Tim Ferriss、yeah. and from Joe Rogan, like you know all these,、um, and also Impact Theory. I think、oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. they're doing、yeah. such a good job, you know, like trying to bring the greatest minds, you know, to. Also, what really inspired me is that the great minds that we see as heroes、mm-hmm. or you know entrepreneurs, they actually all have their. Doubts in life. They all have their, you know, difficulties. So in the past, I always felt alone. I felt like、mm. I'm, I'm worthless. <laughs> you know, like oh, I had all the education. I'm supposed to be one of, you know, whatever elite group.、Yeah. But what the hell? I'm nothing. <laughs> so I felt really alone and felt really, you know, small. But then listening to them really made me realize it's a human thing.、Mm. So it made me、yeah. feel better for sure and appreciate them also in another perspective. And so, that's when I got interested. Like I want to try.、Mm. So you know, if I say I'm a content creator, <laughs> I, I do podcast. So in audio, I、mm. make yoga videos on、yeah. YouTube, and Bilibili is also in Chinese,、mm-hmm. and I also write. And、uh, so I'm trying all the forms at yeah, that time,、yeah. all the formats, like whatever I can do. I even tried vlog, but、uh-huh. in the end, it's not my thing. So no. <laughs> <laughs> then、Same. I let、yeah. it go, right? <laughs> So the podcast, I think、uh, Tim Ferriss mentioned that he said even how he started his podcast is he tried six times. Oh wow! Like you know, so everything he wants to do, he tries it for six times. If he likes it or if he has some traction, then he keeps going at keeps going at it. If not, then he would drop it.、Mm. So I was just thinking to give it a try,、yeah. and then I started when I was in Budapest,、uh-huh. and so at that time I was just trying to. 
make a show about what I've learned, uh -huh. <laughs> like all the books or something. And uh, the name came up because um, I was in India for a month during before the podcast show mm -hmm. I started. So um, I was reading a lot in Rumi. So oh, he's Rumi, the, the poet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He's the boss, the Persian, yeah, uh -huh. Persian yeah, poet, Persian exactly. Poets, yeah. So he had a very interesting saying that um, set your life on fire ah, yes. and seek those fan your flames. Oh, so, wow, so yeah, I really enjoyed it. But basically, you know, living a digital nomad at that time, it was, um, I mean, it's already quite sophisticated, I think, during that time, but it's not as prevalent, you know, mm. as popular as now. So at that time, I still need to explain to everybody what mm. I'm doing, you yeah. know, why I'm here. And if you're not a tourist, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> like, it's really weird. And so for me, I feel it's just, um, um, if this truly fits me or fits anybody, I'd like to, you know, also fan their flames. Mm. So I felt all the books I've been reading, you know, all the people I've been following, mm. all the inspirations. So I, I would, you know, just love to share. So that's how the yeah. name Fan Your Flame comes, comes out. And in Chinese wine is actually quite funny, right? It's yeah, like, it is. <laughs> yeah. It's like you want to do something bad. Oh, you, exactly. Yeah. Actually, exactly. Yeah, put oil yeah. on fire. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess yeah. it's the rebellious feeling. Because yeah, yeah, in yeah. China, it's, yeah. it's very unconventional uh -huh. to, to go on this path, right? Because yeah. we are in a certain phase in our society that... People are looking for what Americans were looking for, you know, <laughs> during the I don't know 60s or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I found the name quite quite funny, but True. the content has nothing to do with yeah, it. Yeah, that's the end. why I found your content it's such a contrast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, I'm very into the meditation and the personal growth part on your podcast. Yeah. So when did you start to have a thought about your life? The early 20s or oh no 20s. oh wow yeah early uh -huh. 20s was tough right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was some brainless party time yeah, yeah it is I think, yeah we all yeah. go through that exactly because we're so young we yeah. all just try to fit in mm -hmm. so what I said before I was trying to understand me like mm -hmm. personally what yeah. I was you know suffering from or what I get joy from, but I feel generally it's actually a humanity, you know, mm. commonality for sure. Yeah. So what I read very interestingly, because um, last year I was focused on neuroscience, oh, yeah. and so there's this professor, Robert Sapolsky, he has amazing classes from Stanford, oh, okay. it's, it's actually an uh, open course, it's oh, for free okay. online, it's like neuroscience 101, you know, <laughs> so it's, it's very good, I would recommend it to anybody who's yeah. interested in, you know, how human behaviors come from. So he was talking about um, how our, you know, the prefrontal cortex, like mm. the brain part, you know, that's the part that makes us human, right? Uh -huh. To make the rational judgment and stuff. Actually, before you're 25, this part, the neurons, up. yeah, they are not fully connected. Yeah. So it's very interesting. Like for me, I kind of get the gist that uh, oh, I felt more like, you know, not say confident, but I feel more whole as a person mm -hmm. after maybe when I was 28, 29. Yeah. But when I was 20, I think 22 to 26, it was such a mess. Because, <laughs> you know, I feel I'm someone, but I'm still also trying to fit in. Yeah. So, you know, like even if you feel you are so rebellious, but even with this, you know, this rebel feeling you still want to fit in True. some you know in some kind of group or whatever mm -hmm. so for me it was very interesting so in the early 20s I was just I like everybody I want everybody to like me yeah. as, you know <laughs> just, people pleaser yeah. people pleaser exactly yeah. yeah so it was fun of course mm -hmm. I think nobody can really take this experience away from anybody we all have to you know go through it some people don't. I don't know. Some people mature really <laughs> earlier. Yeah. Not me. <laughs> not me. Not me either. <laughs> yeah. So I think we share quite some common path. Yeah. yeah. So for me to really look into meditation, like the the things you you're also interested in, mm. is that um, ever since I was 28. So yeah. when I was 27, I got a, into like a very, I don't want to call it depression because. I, I never got diagnosed and I don't want to, you know, use the word in inflation. But I was just generally unhappy and for a very long time, despite mm. I was living in Europe, which was like a childhood dream, you know, for <laughs> Chinese people, I don't know. Yes. And, uh, yeah, so I, I didn't know why. And 
then I was starting to look into it, and that's how things get started. And I, try, I understood we all have a monkey mind, you know. Yeah. Oh, so what my mind is telling me is not necessarily me. Oh my God, that's so interesting. So at that <laughs> age, too, to even just heard about the sentence, and then I started to try to meditate, and failed, yeah. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> And uh, yeah, what kind of meditation at that you? time? Oh. Yeah, I think it was Headspace. Oh, I so, see. Yeah. So it's um, I think Headspace is like a mixture of everything. Mm. They they, I mean, how do you define what kind of meditation? There are different methods, mm -hmm. but I feel the ultimate path is generally the same: is to be aware and to have the mindfulness. Mm. So just the technique I was using was mainly the breathing technique. So it's more yeah, vipassana mm -hmm. and this, this direction, yeah. So I was never really into transcendental meditation. Oh, yes. I think oh. you were, yeah, you yeah. had the experience. Yeah, I got my wake-up call because I had a two panic attacks oh, in wow. one year. Then I, I That's was much over. more intense. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? like, yeah, just like you, I was questioning. Oh, I live such a good life. I have a good job. I have a boyfriend. Yeah. And, uh, my life is wonderful in other people's eyes, but I don't know why I have a panic attack. Yeah, it's so interesting. Yeah. How old were you at that time? I think around 27. Yeah, okay, 27, very similar. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that also could be the first you know, self-awareness. What am I doing? Yeah, uh, like maybe exactly. before you know you just trying to be successful in a conventional way mm -hmm. or yeah. you know a rat race. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think once you achieve everything the society requires you achieve, then you start to question. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. But I guess for me, I never achieved anything. So yeah, unlike you, I was <laughs> yeah. I was just you know hanging around. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, true. Like, at that time, I was also married. Like, oh, you know, yes. I, ha I was happily married, uh -huh. and I was surprised that it wasn't enough. Yeah. You know, like, I was such a, you know, girl that, you know, had this ideal about, you know, relationship or mm -hmm. anything. But then I think it, for me, it was quite, I think maybe you were career-focused. <laughs> yeah. And I'm very self-aware. I know I'm very emotional, and I'm a very relationship-based person. So when I realized that even the person I'm with who, you know, who could be, I call, quote, uh -huh. soulmate, yes. and we're together, we're happily together, and it's still not enough. Okay, that's not it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's not the answer. Definitely. Yeah. So that, that for me, like you, maybe, you know, when you realize money or status or whatever, mm -hmm. it's not the answer, then you start yeah. to look inside. So how, how do you find the solution? You know, there are so many different philosophies and different meditation or yoga. How have you tried everything? Yeah, I mean, in the beginning, of course, yeah. I was so curious and uh, also shattered in a way, you know, yeah. like, oh, you know, meditation maybe could be something I misunderstood the whole time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but generally, I... Actually, I followed yoga with Adrian. I think she's the I think she's the biggest yoga channel oh, online. Yeah, yeah. So I have to say, because we we're, were born in China, for me, religious. You know, like if we use yoga in a very traditional way, maybe in the beginning I would, uh, you know, kind of reject it, mm. like naturally, you know, from mentally or whatever from yeah. our background <laughs> yeah. environment. But the yoga with Adrian, she made it really accessible to everybody. So she, she was never talking about chakras, or she never oh, want to force you, you know, to kind of to have a philosophy about yoga, but uh, generally use yoga as a tool. So for me, in the beginning, this works as wonders because mm. I, I just wanted to feel better, you know, like okay. to put it to the simplest way. I just want to feel better. And uh, with the yoga, I think it was for the first time I could try to connect my breath with the body. And for me, it's, I'm, I'm a very jumpy person. <laughs> so, so for me, this is like, you know, miraculous. It's really, it does miracle for me. I, I felt much more grounded. And then from there on, I started to look more, look deeper into what it's really about, you know. And then that's why I also went to India in the oh, end. Yeah. yeah. But still, even today, I don't practice, I cannot say I practice one school of yoga. Mm -hmm. I generally still apply mm -hmm. yoga in a way that is, quote, practical, mm -hmm. yet um, a reminder of mindfulness. So yeah. generally try to bring it 
just into my daily life, but not to make it, uh, not religiously practicing it. Yeah. It's very important to find your way of yes. practicing. Yeah. yeah, I also try different meditations and yoga. Yeah, I can't do the guided meditation. Oh, I'm you can't. very irritated when people talk uh, when I'm yeah. meditating. So transcendental meditation is perfect for me. I'm just Makes sitting sense. there yeah, by myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah true. Then you're a true self-learner. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, nowadays I read a lot of Zen meditation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. also pretty good. I can just sit there. Okay, yeah. like uh, what, what is your interpretation of Zen meditation? Uh, I'm only the beginner of yeah. that. Yeah, beginners so are the best. You know, beginners actually have a sometimes <laughs> deeper understanding and more yes. of a objective understanding. In my opinion, actually, you yeah. know, of one area. Because my grandpa, he's been practicing Zen for his whole life. Oh wow! So he also wrote some poems and uh, left a lot of books on this subject. So I read Zen Buddhism when wow. I was very little, but I have no idea what is it. <laughs> yeah, just know the stories. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm not very focused on the practical things. But, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. you know, Jim Ferris did a, a podcast on Zen Buddhism. Oh, and really? I have a friend, and he also went to the Zen Buddhism, Buddhism Center to practice. That's mm-hmm. how I get into it. Uh, okay. Yeah, so I find, yeah, because um, that's more focused on my mind. Mm-hmm. During pandemic, I find I lost my co- concentration. I don't know if it's from the anxiety or stress. Oh, yeah. I can't focus on it's deep work. Global issue, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I find, yeah, the meditation can help me just do very focus and okay. just do, for example, if you eat, you just eat. You don't yes. do anything. Yes. yes, yes. So what's your understanding for that? I think you did I an think- episode. Actually, podcast about that. Yeah, it's it's quite interesting. So for past years, I write here and there, and I think since this year, I've been practicing. I mean, I'm still a teacher beginner, but uh, I'm starting to have a little bit of personal insight into it. So I made a series. It's it's all in Chinese, so don't even bother to me. <laughs> <laughs> maybe How can you unless you speak English? Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I wrote a series and I made it into a podcast. Yeah. It's called like uh, I mean, it's mm-hmm. kind of you know the personal Wait. awakening, yeah. um, you know, experience. So I made it into four parts. Like the first is impermanence, mm-hmm. the wu chang, and the second is shen yan, is the language we use, how it actually really prisons our mind and our yes. understanding mm-hmm. of everything actually, but it's the basic of communication. So that was also. Another thing comes up with mindfulness for me. And the third one is obviously like, you know, um, in the moment, um, mm-hmm. like, um, how, how do you describe it? Uh, ah, how do be we, present. Like be present, mm-hmm. yeah, exactly. So, yeah, and the last one is egoless. But I have to say the egoless thing, I'm still on the process. I'm still. <laughs> but the first three, so recent, Camilla mentioned as a recent episode, it's like be present. So that was the whole feeling I, I got from um, meditation and uh, I cannot really say that it's only from meditation because I feel there are certain type of people they are just they can use a different way to be mindful like yoga could be okay for a certain type of people but for other people just walking is a meditation mm-hmm. or just you know um, do sports, you know. Yeah, like I even find running. one do intensity exactly. activity. I found I'm so exactly. Zen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because it's generally it, it doesn't matter of the format, yes. but it's really how where do we put our mind, right? So sure. it doesn't matter um, what you do. So for me, it was yoga and uh, meditation, and uh, then um, I kind of got a sense of. Oh, what did it really mean to be, you know, when I eat, I eat. Because yeah. I heard a you know, long time about it. Yeah. And I kind of, you know, using your rationality to get it. Like, oh, when I eat, I should just eat. But uh, recently, I think I had, for the, you know, kind of first time or first more intense time of feeling that when I'm eating, I'm really eating. When I'm walking, I'm really walking. It's still very difficult. I cannot, you know, really... Um, make it stay but it's not about to make it stay but it's it's already crazy to experience it's just when I'm eating I think in the past when everybody's eating especially <laughs> nowadays eating is social you know when you're eating with friends with family and we talk 
and while we eat, we talk, we kind of lost touch with the food. And but in our you know modern age, we in such a fortunate time that we get to experience food in such a you know vibrant and abundant way, right?、Mm-hmm. That which has never been there in the human history. But we kind of just lost the contact with it after the third bite.、Yeah. I think most of us do. I mean, for me, it's definitely that. I'm such a foodie. <laughs> I love food, but I really realize how when I'm eating, maybe I'm thinking. When I'm eating. I'm maybe trying to make a conversation. Even when I eat alone, I think for a long time when I was eating alone, I was watching a movie. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> right, I was watching <laughs> <Yes> . Friends, <laughs> like, <laughs> watch a、yeah. show. It's it's such a funny combination. It's it's joy, you know. I, I find it funny. Like I eat and watch, I just feel happy.、Yeah. But now I realized when that was not eating, that was really just dumping, you know, the food inside of me, and that made me really anxious. In fact, you know, also made me eat more for sure. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, because that's obviously when our mind is not here.、Mm-hmm. Right? So when that's that's how I felt about when I eat. I eat so recently. I'm also trying to you know when I eat breakfast or eat anything, I would just sit down with myself now. Because、yeah. in the past maybe you're in such a rush. I want to learn more, <laughs> or I want to you know be entertained. And、uh, then you either listen to a book or you read a book and eat, or you're working, you eat. So, for me, that's that's already. It sounds so small, right?、Uh-huh. It sounds so small. It's not even like a spiritual enlightenment or anything. But for me, it's such an enlightenment. That is, what does it really mean? And then when you can reach this type of mindfulness, you realize there's no past and there's no future.、Yeah. And then if you, in a literal way, if we are just、yeah. here, then everything's fine. Really, like everything's fine.、Mm-hmm. You know? What about the impermanent? Impermanent. Yeah, yeah. That's. I guess that's the kind of foundation for、mm-hmm. every everything I will write. Also, I, I will experience in our life. I think,、um, like how we feel so unsatisfied. How easily we feel unsatisfied. We're also easily satisfied, <laughs> you know. But then the dopamine kicks comes、yeah. very fast. Um, so the impermanence—it's actually a very long-term、um, Buddhism teaching, right? Sure. Yeah. In Buddhism, I think the first thing you need to learn is that you need to let go. And、uh, impermanence is basically teaching us if we can, you know, let it go, or, or actually anything. If we want to hold on to something anytime, when we want to hold on to something, when we want to buy something, when we purchase, is actually something we want to. It should be mine. When we labor something that's mine, even in a relationship, my best friend, my husband, my boyfriend, and then you know, it's it's creating pain in inevitably because、um, I mean, if we're all adults, you know, we don't need to lie to ourselves. We're saying goodbye to so many things already, even when we were young. So the entire life is also, I think. It sounds so sad. It's a you know a journey to learn how to say goodbye properly. I think. I mean, if I learn to reach that, I think it's such a fulfilling life because then I also cherish it. Maybe you know more. I would be more in the moment for、mm-hmm. sure, and I also understand I'm immortal, and also so is everybody. So is the earth. So is the, who knows what's the universe. So then it. Could broaden my view definitely for sure, and then it made me also less attached to things.、Mm-hmm. And even I'm trying really hard to learn how to be less attached to relationships. I think it's the hardest. That's so hard. We're、yeah. social animals. <laughs> <laughs> so I used to if、um, I lost a friend, I、mm. probably it took me a couple of years to recover. To But recover. now I kind of、uh, accept that. Yeah. No permanent relationship, yeah, right? Friendship,、yeah. your family, your family, yeah. Yeah, they can only take company for such a short journey with you. Yeah, they will go. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't want to say this like now we're tone, our tones even, you、yeah. know, went low a bit. I don't see it in a pessimistic way. Actually,、mm-hmm. I don't、yeah. anymore, at least.、Mm-hmm. In the beginning, it's very sad,、uh-huh. but、uh, now I feel it. 
and you know, even like to remind yourself you're gonna die, you know, soon, <laughs> it makes you live more, right? True. Like, just naturally. So, I think we should learn this. We should try to understand. Yeah, I even got a tattoo on my arm to oh, remind yeah. me. Memento now I'm looking mori. at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Memento mori. Yeah. yeah, that's that's very smart. Yeah. So I, what, what yeah. does it for you? Like, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, memento mori is remember you shall die, right? Yeah, remember. Yeah. yeah. So mm-hmm. how, how did it make you to come to this point? You know, like to... I think it, I love this phrase from Ryan Holiday because mm. he's a very evil story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is one of the story philosophy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, memento mori. There are so many people left me in the past decade for family, for friends. Some is my reason I move around. <laughs> yeah, I have such a free spirit. So I say goodbye to many people yeah, yeah, yeah. in my life. And uh, some family member, they dead, mm. which they, they have huge impact on my life, but uh, they gone. Yeah, so they're... it's kind of teaching me. Yeah. Okay. You, you yeah. can't fight against the death. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Inevitable. So you just need to accept that. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think once I accept the fact that yeah, people are going to die, people are going to leave you, that's okay. But you kind of um, um, have this optimistic attitude. Yeah, towards true. Death. Yeah, it's death is not the scary things anymore. No, it's you're not, facing yeah. it straight away. Yeah, 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 exactly. Actually, when you mentioned this, it also reminded me of... Um, I was also look very deep into Stoicism. Mm. And uh, they're very interesting philosophers, right? Like, uh, you definitely, you know, you think about the worst scenario mm. and then you realize if it's not death, it's not the worst scenario. <laughs> so I like it. But on the other hand, it's very connected actually to Buddhism and uh, yeah. to um, Taoism. So, like in Taoism, for example, I was reading about uh, Zhuangzi, mm-hmm. he's, or he's you know, it's similar one of to my Lao Tzu. Right? Yeah. And so, basically, how I feel, I mean, obviously, we don't know how the uh, Stoic philosophers, how their daily life was like, but, you know, according to Seneca, or the. Um, I read about him, or even you know the Marcus, the uh, what was Aurelius. His? yeah, Aurelius. Aurelio Marcus, um, like his meditations. You kind of feel it's like in a path, you know, to try to learn to be self-disciplined, mm. in a way, you know. So it has this feeling of teaching, and uh, a feeling of you need to under, you know, feel the suffering and understand the pain. It's obviously very good. But when I look deeper into meditation and also like in Buddhism meditation and also Taoism, I realize it's the same approach, mm. but like Zhuangzi is extremely optimistic. <laughs> and I feel the people who live in the moment who are very aware of death, they're actually the happiest people you know, on earth. Yeah. <laughs> they don't hold on to anything anymore. It's nothing you, know, you can hold on to. And so, yeah, so Zhuangzi, as, you know, we learned in school, he, uh-huh. he even would, uh, you know, make a music when his wife died, yeah. right? when his wife passed away. Yeah. I think we have a saying in it, Gu Peng Er Ge, but uh, I remember when I was a kid, I was thinking, oh, the, wow, I cannot imagine, you know, the closest <laughs> the person dies, and then I would, you know, sing and, you know, to be joy, to have joy in the funeral. But I think re- recently then I really went to, I, I tried to read it, what he was saying. Then I realized actually we were all learning just the episodic of the story. So mm. obviously he was sad. He was mm. very sad. And then his friend, you know, his friend came and it was a conversation, right? <laughs> the, the Taoism teachings. And uh, the, the friend arrived and says, oh, why are you singing? You mm. know, this doesn't make sense at all. And, you know, you don't even have respect for your dead wife. And then he, he's like, of course I was sad, but uh, you need to... Uh, but then I just gave it a second thought. I know if I'm, I keep being sad, she's not returning. Yeah. Then I, why don't I just celebrate her mm. existence, yeah. you know, instead of mulling over something that would never come back again. So that gave me a touch of that Zhuangzi is very human, Mm -hmm. actually. So it's not that, it's not our fault we feel sad, you know. (laughs) Even if you meditate for 50 years, you might still be sad. So, but it's it's human, it's the human part of us. We should enjoy it and also have the ability to, you know, really take a turn in your, just have a second thought and not to 
dwell, that's the whole teaching of meditation, not to follow your train of thoughts, but to board another train, or to get out of this sadness train, and then you know it passes, right? You also mentioned Su Shi. He's one of my favorite writers. Yeah. He's so interesting, yeah, right? Yeah, he's also very optimistic about his life, because he was being exiled to Hainan, oh, yeah. which is uh, so far away, and yeah. And then he wrote uh, Tian Ya Hai Jiao. Yeah, he, yeah. he described it as the end of the world in uh-huh. a very beautiful way. Yeah. So then the officials are like, damn, you know, we even put him, you know, to the worst place. And he still sees beauty in it. Exactly. That's amazing, right? Yeah. He has a lot of uh, Buddha friends. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, too. I think he probably gets some yeah, ideas from them. Yeah, like um, I think in his writings, uh, I think ever since he was a child, he mm. was you know, very influenced by Zen Buddhism, yeah, in fact. Yeah. And uh, I think I really like him as well because he is not, you know, he didn't give up his daily life, daily joy. Oh, okay. In China, there's even a dish named by him, the, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, Dong Po Rou, Rou. the fattest, you know, <laughs> belly, yeah. the pork okay. belly, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that's what he, his, his favorite food was. Uh-huh. So he doesn't gave up and or you know don't dive into a cave for 30 years I mean that's very respectful definitely but I just like that you know there's a, another approach as a normal person as you know yeah. uh, speaking of him today is the mid-autumn festival oh, yeah. he wrote the the most famous, famous poem. Uh, yeah, poem about, yeah, yeah, it's about true. the moon yeah, it, he mentioned like people have a joy, sorrow we have reunion, we have separation and the moon also dim and wrong exactly, yeah, yeah the moon but, changes itself yeah, you know, we see it every day uh, yeah, that's, the whole world is imperfect but we just accept it yeah. as long as we can uh, appreciate the moon yeah. at the same time although we thousand miles apart yeah exactly it's very very beautiful so in this part I kind of appreciate Chinese education I mean there are a lot of you know problems with our (laughs) education maybe every education in every country but um, for me I felt we we had to recite the poem do you remember you have to remember it like by words hundreds of yeah, and we were like, I don't know, 13, 14, we were really young, even since younger. I have to say at that time I had no idea, you know, yeah. what's going on. I, I know it's beautiful, but you couldn't really relate. Yeah. And uh, now I think even for Germans, they have such good, they have so many good philosophers, right? But the, yeah. but I feel the students are very distant from them. Whereas, you know, because um, for them it's a deep, you know, learning, mm-hmm. it's a kind of uh, another structure. But for us, we appreciate the beauty of all these, we don't even call them philosophers, mm-hmm. but uh, kind of deeply ingrained in ourselves, which mm-hmm. of course shape who we are, you know, mm-hmm. but also made me at least how I felt. I'm sure you too, you know, mm-hmm. to really, to understand it, have a sense of, you know, like epiphany yeah, one day. Yeah. Just one day, you know, yeah. we were reciting so many poems uh-huh. and just one day this makes sense. Yeah. Oh, wow, I, I find that already like an <laughs> enlightenment. Like that's... Yeah. That's such an amazing experience. Exactly. I remember one of my friends, she told me, like, when you look at the moon, you won't say, oh, it's fucking beautiful. <laughs> you will have this poem come out, yeah, that you recited when you, when you were a child. Yeah. That makes sense. Although back then, you have no idea what they are talking about. But yeah. when you grow up, you kind of have this feeling. Yeah. You can use the poem to... To express it. yourself, yeah. and you you see the subtleties. Yeah. I think you know how they described it and how you oh wow I see it. You know, it's yeah. Really nice. Yeah. And you mentioned you you haven't reached that egoless. Yeah. Oh, egoless. Yeah. Egoless. yeah. yeah. Okay. No, not really. I have to say not really. Mm-hmm. But when I was in India, it was one month yoga teaching. Oh. So kind of, uh, and during that time, when you're not actively looking for it, <laughs> right? Usually it's like that. So it, it's very natural. It just I felt because we need to meditate. I think every day three hours, and we practice yoga every day three hours as well. So uh, and it's in a group setting, and uh, everyone's trying to learn. So it's a perfect setting. So the set and setting are so important. And then sometimes we would have, you know, like uh, chanting. We, we would sing together in the evening. Or we talk about one topic, like why do we have fear or, you know, love or death, these kind of things. And I think during that time, I've had the feeling of oneness. Mm. 
but it was momentary. So I have to say, for me, it's I guess for everybody it couldn't be forever. I don't know. Maybe someone, no. yeah. <laughs> maybe some, yeah. No idea. Spiritual leaders, I don't know. But uh, that I did experienced, and uh, I I know it sounds amazing and it makes you also kind of want to hold on to it. Yeah. <laughs> for sure, and that's also I think then I was interested in psychedelic. You know, mm-hmm. the the entire thing or the under the medical use and also the spiritual use. Of this new, I mean, it's a very untouched area, at, at definitely in Asia. But that was interesting. That, but then I also slowly realized that I was holding on to something. Mm-hmm. Like, why do I have to, you know, be that again? So for me, I have to admit, it's um, com- it comes and goes. Mm-hmm. So like, even when I was sharing my experience with the, I was also keep telling, you know, all the people I'm sharing with. I don't want to say that I'm teaching, not at all. Mm-hmm. I'm sharing, and I also um, don't want to say that when I say I felt oneness, you cannot label me as someone. <laughs> oh, she knows, you know, she, she got it. <laughs> so, you know, it's also the danger of language. Like, we, we are so, even for, for our just general communication, maybe sometimes we have different understanding of one word, but we're using the same word, mm-hmm. right? And then in the end, we have different understanding of each other or each other how do you see the world Mm -hmm. and so I know words are very limiting but it's also a great great tool obviously so I'm trying always to also put the stress on the impermanence of words Mm -hmm. so um, when I say I was living the moment (laughs) maybe I was I was for a bit and that was my deepest understanding but it doesn't mean I'm still now. I have to tell you, I, I distract all the time. <laughs> like, I'm here, I'm there, I'm, I have to remind myself all the time. But I think the reminding process is the practice already. Yeah. So trying to make peace with it so, as well. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me about the famous saying, like, before then, you say mountains, mountains, you say rivers, oh, rivers. Yeah. yeah, during then. You see mountains, mountains. Mountain. Oh yeah. And after the you you see you mountains, see mountains, mountains. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes I feel like I'm talking about mountain, but maybe the the other people will think the mountain very differently. In, yeah. yeah, in the first level. Maybe I talk about the third level. It could be. Yeah. yeah. So I found it's so hard to find the people intellectual wave as the same intellectual wave as you when talking. Ah uh, yeah, yeah. I, I guess and. Uh, I think we all have empathy for sure, mm. but um, yeah, that's also something that's troubling me now. Because mm. you know, like when I was, uh, it's kind of funny. When I started in 2018, I was, you know, on the I was a beginner of yoga, so I was, you know, super into yoga. I was like, oh, love, you know, we need to love is the answer, you know. Yeah. And then I was feeling every stranger is an unmet friend, and so you know, I had this approach. It actually definitely made me very happy. But also made me into, like, got me into situations that I actually felt um, I was uncomfortable with some kind of, you know, certain type of people. We're all different, but, you know, I think the deep core are the same. But uh, we live the life very differently, for sure. Yeah, Yeah, also how we, and we're all in different stages. So I also believe in relationship is great with timing. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, we met now, we Mm -hmm. kind of went through the similar process it doesn't even need to be similar we all have our path but we, we both kind of you know we all try to grow mm-hmm. and then yeah. try to learn from it and then you know maybe for some other people some people grow earlier so when they are younger they look at us they think oh, what a bunch of idiots <laughs> i don't know <laughs> maybe and maybe some people grow later so i think it's really timing kind yeah, of timing for me so it is, yeah. If in the wrong time you met the right people, oh, you probably, yeah. yeah it's all so wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how, how can you make sure you find your soulmate? You got married already. Yeah, uh, yeah I think I, I got very lucky. Mm-hmm. And I have this theory of my yes. own, <laughs> you know, like what, what about the soulmate? Because I was such a romantic. Yes. And so... I, so when I was young, when I was in a relationship, my I thought what a soulmate is that um, someone who you know understands you without saying like the plateau, you know, like you're one piece actually. And uh, then I realized actually because of this mindset that got me into trouble with all this relationship because when they fail me, when they you know disappoint me, 
I would feel like, oh, this makes sense that we are not soulmates. That's why you disappoint me. But oh my God, what an immature thinking, right? So now I kind of, even because uh, I met my husband, we were quite young the time we met, but uh, also we had our own experiences. But um, so at that time, I was thinking we are, you know, really matching. We met at the same time, uh, t- same, you know, perfect timing. We understand each other. And he's such a communicative person as well. And so I thought, oh, this is it, right? You know, <laughs> I got it. And then I told you in the beginning, I also realized that's not the answer. Even if, you know, he's the soulmate, it didn't solve anything. But um, and so how I realized is that when he first time he disappointed me, you know, in some very small way, I was also a little bit shattered. I was 26 or something. I was, I was thinking, oh, wow, even he couldn't, you know, be the one. Then I was very scared. But also during that time, I learned that, okay, actually soulmate is a spectrum. <laughs> it's really just, you know, how much percentage. So maybe... We, we meet people, we meet the other person who is 90%, you know, similar, or not to, sim- not to say similar, but, you know, fitting to us. Then we feel they are soulmates, but we forgot there's still 10% to work. Mm-hmm. So relationship is work. I really believe that. It, it is compromise, but it is not in a negative way of compromising, I feel. So it's like we are maybe 80, you even 80 percent some people are 80 percent matching but they put the 20 percent work then they are 100 yeah. percent so i think it doesn't matter and definitely don't go under the 50 percent right? <laughs> <Then> <laughs> it's too much work <laughs> too, yeah too much work doesn't make sense yeah. it's doomed yeah. so so now how i understand is really we we have so many soulmates honestly you, yeah. you will meet so many but the ones who understand it in a way you understand it, how you look at relationship, again, back to the words, right? how we use words, is, uh, I think, the most important thing to, to having a soulmate. Like, even if you have your certain image of marriage, mm. then if this person has a total different one, then you got married, this conflict. But it doesn't mean conflict cannot be solved. It just means, can you maybe find a path that both of you understand, right? Mm. So for me, I think for me and my husband, it's, it was also like a deep learning curve <laughs> in our relationship. It's, um, it's not smooth. It's never smooth. But in, I thought it would be smooth, so yeah. it's still not. But uh, we have ups and downs. But now, I think we are, as we both grow, mm. it's really, it can peak all the time. You know, like um, we, have, we are together more than seven years, and I was with... Um, my friend, because seven years, like this, yeah, seven yeah, years each, yeah. right? So I was with my best friend in Berlin, and he just got married, and he was very interested. He says, uh, obviously now I'm in a honeymoon phase, where first two years, it's always the, you know, highest point, or the oxytocin, you know, the hormones, they're all there. And then he asked, you know, how are you and him? And uh, I was looking back at it, I felt, you know, wow, we had another peak, you know? So I think it was wrong. People shouldn't just teach their seven, seven years each. Mm-hmm. There could be, you know, maybe 10 years another high, mm-hmm. honestly. Yeah. So I think it also made me look at relationship in a different way. So, you know, because yeah. we have so many conventional thoughts, uh-huh. thoughts on this thing, right? Yeah. On this topic. Yeah. You mentioned your husband, he's a very rational oh, yeah. person. Yeah. So how does he see the spirituality? Will he against it or... So yeah, I think he's not he's not against it mm-hmm. at all. Actually, he um, brought me into meditation, so he was practicing it yeah. first. And uh, but he's such a, I think for a certain type of people, mm-hmm. they're so rational, mm-hmm. they kind of don't dwell on their thoughts. Mm-hmm. So I feel um, my husband's very. So what he attracted me, uh, was so attracted to me was also that he was never you know really holding on to anything Uh yes he was very you know he has senses about it like it doesn't make sense you know if you try to hold on to anything even relationships so in the beginning i was very you know what's funny i can share this is he he almost would never say i love you Uh 
And it was very hard for me in the beginning. I know he loves me, but I just want him to tell me. And so he would say it maybe once, three years or something. (laughs) And yeah, and I was, I was, uh, and at that time I was like, you you know, I don't care. Just smooth talk me. (laughs) Like, like talk something nice. I want to hear it. And then he would be like, yeah, I can tell you I love you now. And I was like, so not tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> so it was very childish, but it was very funny. And he says, I cannot promise I will love you tomorrow. I cannot promise I will love you 10 years from now. So at that time, I took it very personally. I was very sad. Uh-huh. And I don't get it. But now I kind of feel that he, he kind of was really in the moment. You know, like he, he appreciates there are times he maybe dislikes me a little bit. And there are times he truly loves me. And I find this so authentic. And uh, I, I, he taught me in this way also to love that I do not, you know, fall into my own trap. You know, mm. like sometimes we're like, oh, I love this person. Then this means I should love him every second. Mm. Or, you know, I should, I have this certain image of should, yeah. you know, or should not uh, about it. But actually, again, mindfulness in relationship, I think it also, it's mm. very, very helpful. Mm. So, yeah. So your question was about spirituality. He mm-hmm. he's okay. He doesn't practice anymore at all. <laughs> <laughs> Would that um, affect you for your spirituality? No, spiritual not really. Yeah. Not really. So mm-hmm. I think ultimately we are uh, we are curious about the same mm-hmm. thing. You know, like how why do we have this behavior? Mm-hmm. You know, why why do we think even in this way? So we, we oftentimes we would sit down and then we have a topic and then we realize we thought we understood each other, but actually because of our different culture, different background, even in the same culture, right? You know, different family of growing up, with different friendship, friends and uh, influences. So there are different interpretations of a lot of things. Mm. So when it comes to this, we try to understand each other, and then we realize, oh wow, that's you know very interesting. Mm. And then it also makes relationship interesting because you know you also because come on, you're together for so long. What's new? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I understand physiologically. The passion is obviously it, it just dies down physiologically, mm-hmm. and so what keeps the sparks on is really you know how you I don't know how you approach life together I guess mm. yeah. have you found any cross culture like conflict in oh, yeah. relationship oh yeah yes. there are a lot <laughs> I think that there are many and they're all quite funny I think oh yeah the funniest one is yeah. I'm from China mm-hmm. and uh, so generally we are very family oriented mm-hmm. um, nation right and uh I like to use the word, the pronoun we a lot. Yes. I like to say, oh, we oh, like it. Yeah, oh, we yeah. will go there. Oh, and then whenever and we're with friends and then I'm always family and we describe if we're in Madeira together. If yes. someone asks me, you know, how's Madeira? I would say, oh, we really like it. <laughs> and then Felix says, how do you and I, how do you know I like it? <laughs> you know, so, so he's, he's very funny. He, he yeah. makes it very clear. I am I, uh-huh. you are you, oh, okay. and then there's you and me, not mm-hmm. we. So you know, it's it's a very interesting thought, right? Uh, like a, uh, you know, for us a collective thinking, uh-huh. yeah, and then for him it's an individual thinking. Uh-huh. Yeah. So there are many details like this that, uh-huh. that's very fun. In the beginning, it could be conflict. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. it could be like because because I would like offended. I would be offended. Sure, I was like, yeah. why not? We we did go there to, and you were laughing, you were smiling. I assume you're happy, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, and then he also would be like a little bit he feels why there's always we <laughs> like so and now we understand this so when I use we and when he uses I mm. uh, we both don't feel offended anymore so so kind of you need even this smallest thing right in the mm. past you wouldn't even think about it True. but uh, when you're more aware you try to understand it even the smallest thing can make a difference mm-hmm. you know, in the quality of yeah. communication for sure so what's your plan for the rest of the year? Yeah, the rest of the year, I think, generally, uh, I wanted to say we again. Yeah. <laughs> generally. <laughs> uh, so our pattern or my pattern is that we can, I can only plan for the next uh-huh. month or something. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I will go to Lisbon and then go to, uh, passing by Lisbon, mm-hmm. I go to Spain. So... It is a we. We did want yeah, to check out together. Spain. <laughs> <laughs> we want to check out Spain together. So yeah, that's that's the next plan, and then we will see. I will see <laughs> how it is, 
and then yeah. Still continue the Still, digital nomad life. Yeah, I guess. Mm. I guess I, I really enjoy it. Um, but I also don't want to label it too much on myself. Yeah. I think you also felt the same when mm-hmm. you arrived here. The community is amazing, mm-hmm. but whenever there is a community, there's you know there's other things. The pros and cons come together. Yeah. And then in a so for me, I, I never cared you know if I go to a new place if there are nomads or mm-hmm. something. So in the past, um, I was curious about Chiang Mai and Bali. Mm-hmm. I went there. They're fine. They're cool. But I also don't care if I go to Athens. If there are nomads, I don't care. Okay, I would meet, you know, expats and or maybe people from, you know, local. There are locals there. So I feel it's more diverse and it gives me a broader perspective of life that we are not just shaped by the idea of, oh, I have to, you know, have commitment issues. Yeah, <laughs> I have to, you know, keep roaming this this type of lifestyle but it's it's awesome i think they're all independent thinkers that's how yeah. I, how i feel that's so cool. yeah. i enjoy their company um but it's not a necessity yeah yeah i try not to involve with group activity too much yeah i always feel like so yeah, that in is a group a, you will have an irrational behavior oh yeah, yeah. That's, oh that's completely yeah. like typical me when i'm in a group i'm <laughs> i'm lost like the, i'm we <laughs> right so yeah. i'm not i yeah. I sometimes I told my friend, oh, I feel lonely because I'm not belong to anywhere. <laughs> they will say, let's blame yourself. You you are like a void group. You chose you, it. Yeah, you choose it. So you accept it. So yeah. it was your conscious decision, actually. Yeah, it's my conscious decision. You Since know, when? I'm an extrovert. Uh, and yeah. I like, yeah, sometimes I enjoy surrounded with people and I'm very sociable. Mm-hmm. So if I want to, I can. But yeah. I kind of. Yeah, set the rule for myself. Don't too close to the rule. Okay, yeah. so because you, you saw the effect on you. Yeah, mm-hmm. I do say sometimes I do make an irrational decision or affect by other people's opinion. Yeah, that's inevitable, I think. Yeah, so I try to live a solitary life. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, I think it's interesting that your ex- if extroverts, they, they get energy from being in the crowd, right? Yeah. Being with people. Then it must be hard for you to be alone. I think... You know, or it's like a spectrum, spectrum again. Yeah. yeah, it used to can be maybe eighty-five percent extra. Okay, now yeah. probably seventy. Oh, yeah, yeah, true, true. So it's changed. Yeah, yeah. and I quite enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, that's the... No, I don't need to always seeking outside for energy. I can yeah produce energy from within. Oh which wow, is great. yeah, <laughs> that's the best. Yeah. yeah, but still, yeah, the I think the loneliness part is all the human have this feeling yeah there are it's people in the hu- biggest group and feel lonely yeah exactly. right? i think we feel that when we were young yeah. I, I definitely felt that i, mean, I think even, I just accept that yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we should yeah. it's the same as death we should accept loneliness yeah. 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 Sure. great thank you so much for well, your time thank yeah. you for having me yeah so much fun we're talking to you in front of the stage oh, my God. oh I yeah know if, uh, we can we record the Waves. Oh yeah, maybe we should catch a little bit, catch the wave. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, all the best, and uh, I'll probably see you. I'll in, see you yeah, again in, soon. Yeah, it's yeah, been on the Oh, other I'll hear you world. soon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kia ora, 